we had no more funds effectively. And a few months in, I was like, hey man, I don't think we can afford to pay you anymore. So you're a volunteer at this point. If you stick around, I'll make sure that I'll do you right and that we'll pay the salaries back with interest. Thankfully, everybody stayed, not a single person quit. Welcome to Backstage with Millionaires, the show where we bring you the stories of real Indian startups told by the entrepreneurs that build them. I'm Caleb Friesen, and on the show today, how Tushar Vashish took his startup Healthify Me from a simple calorie tracker to a global health tech empire with more than 30 million users worldwide. For many of us, the idea of losing weight oscillates between feeling totally achievable, especially on New Year's Eve when we promise ourselves that I'm going to get fit this year, to feeling absolutely impossible. And the way that our lifestyles are set up doesn't really help with this feeling. We live in a world of desk jobs, long commutes, Netflix, and near limitless access to junk food. More than ever before in human history, we are sedentary, and that means that as a human race, we're gaining weight faster than ever before too. And this is the exact problem that Healthify Me has set out to solve. Using their app and the access to professional coaches that come with it, customers can get back in shape using nutrition tracking and diet planning, and the company also offers hardware like CGMs, that's continuous glucose monitoring sensors, and smart scales for tracking weight. Today, the company has a presence across multiple countries, generates millions of dollars a year in revenue, and has raised more than $100 million in external capital from investors. But in the early days, Healthify Me was just a simple calorie tracker website. Tushar Vashisht had been working at Deutsche Bank throughout his early and mid-twenties, first in San Francisco and then in Singapore, and he felt pretty fit and healthy. But he also missed home, and so in 2010, he shifted back to India, where he quickly realized that the healthy food options he'd grown accustomed to weren't as accessible in India as they were abroad. In fact, he ended up gaining 20 kilos during this chapter of his life, which largely consisted of him contributing to India's unique ID project, today known as Adhar. I remember my mentor and the guy who kind of got me into Aadhaar was uh, Raj Mashruwala. He was the, um, you know, one of the earliest guys out there. Um, and um, and I was living with him in the apartment where Aadhaar was founded, literally. So amongst the first four tasks that I had on my first day, one of them was fill up all the water bottles. You know, and the second one was, please fix the microwave. Um, I never succeeded on the second task. I gave it to the next guy who came in. And I don't think the microwave was ever fixed, by the way. Um, but, you know, it was doing everything from literally filling the water bottles to building the enrollment strategy for Aadhaar and, you know, building the workflows on how the system will go or partnering with McKinsey to figure out what the business model would be or, you know, different states um, chief minister offices um, or the public distribution system. So it was it was kind of everything. It was just 10 people handling whoever could do whatever in the early days. It's amazing to to think back all that. Just 10 people. I mean, now it's ubiquitous. It's just like part of being Indian is Adhar. But at that time, it was you and nine other people. Was that the reason, though, in 2011 that you kind of uh, walked away? It, it had gotten so big that you felt like maybe you're contributions weren't as meaningful or did you just was there another reason why you decided to leave um when i had joined nandan i think and raj my commitment to uh, both of them was that i'd be doing this for two years because it was at voluntary levels or near voluntary levels uh, so it was an impact sort of a you know government mission for me to accomplish uh, or, or help out on so i had that two-year deadline coming in and uh, and yeah i think the you know every six months uh, as the scale got larger, um, you know, and, and as more and more of the uncertainty got lower and uh, stability got higher, I think, um, you know, I wanted to move on to something that would continue to drive that level of excitement and, uh, and impact. Yeah, which is exactly what you did. Uh, 100 rupees a day project, <laughs> which I'm just curious, like, I, I think most people don't wake up in the morning and say, like, I'm going to go starve myself, right? Or I'm going to try to live like, um, how many people were living at that level back so, in 2011? You know, we were ourselves quite surprised that 74% of the country was living less than 100 rupees a day. Wow. Um, X of rent. And this is on an individual level, right? So that is about two or 300 rupees of uh, median household income or mean household income that we had discovered X of rent. 
and um and you know um i think it was it was certainly not a weight loss diet uh, or a regimen uh, i think the way it sort of got to be is that for almost 2 years i was working for the average indian right at aadhar the purpose was to help the average indian get access to government services to benefits to infrastructures identity so we had traveled me and my co-founder matt we had traveled through the length and breadth of the country you know i had gone to villages where you couldn't access via road and you know beyond a certain point and uh, and and lived there and stayed there but i always felt that i was doing this uh, from a bubble right everywhere we'd go we could fly there we could drive down in gov- in cars and stay in government guest houses and it was a fairly sheltered life so it was almost like going and observing through a glass um you know air conditioned room about how india is really operating you've heard of this concept of like uh, poverty tourism yeah i don't think it I know, was i'm not i'm not yeah. saying it was like that it, but it, it was it, you know it was research into india that we were doing frankly but i felt that research didn't feel as genuine as living it um and so i felt that it would be disingenuous if i didn't conclude my you know nearly 2 years long um uh, you know meditation on india with an actual experience um you know and uh, by then i had been armed with a very good perspective from within about the government about policies about the way you know i was i was responsible for working with the public distribution system with the oil and gas system with the financial inclusion system so i was you know deeply familiar with various um aspects of indian machinery i just wanted to make sure that i actually break that glass wall and kind of experience being like the average indian myself so i literally walked across to the to my room and he's like hey listen you know i've kind of been thinking that it'll be incredible to actually experience what an average indian experiences rather than coming from this you know privileged ivy league uh life that we've come down from and 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 you know just observing we wanted to experience i think that would be a good finale and if we could write about it that would be even better and he was you know without being blinking an eye like sure that sounds exciting let's do it um and we didn't never expected us to go down to live at the poverty line but during the experiment the government came out with the definition of the poverty line as 32 rupees a day and we figured that while you know we're living on the 100 rupees a day constraint might as well go down to the 32 rupees and experience what those constraints are all about and turns out that was 37th percentile so a third of our country lives below or lived below 32 rupees a day and we felt that it's only fair that if we experience the 75th percentile let's go experience the 37th percentile and after that it would hopefully leave us with a significant sense of empathy about the country that we live in yeah for sure so matthew ended up being your uh, first co-founder in in healthify me mm-hmm. but i'm curious to know how did you go from that point where you're kind of blogging you're documenting your 100 rupees a day experience to 32 rupees a day for the last week i think mm-hmm. um how did that go from I guess it was like an Excel you were tracking the food that you were eating and the cost. Did that is that how it transformed into Healthify me sort of calorie tracking? Like I'm curious to know what the story is there. So, I think me trying to lose weight by calorie quantified self space was was independent as a trend and me living on that um income level was probably a catalyst to design something for the Indian lifestyle. So, when we were done with the experiment and as we were thinking about what to start up uh we were both very keen on starting up on building something that delivers impact as a huge part of its collateral so we were looking at healthcare we were looking at education as two two areas where we felt that you know no matter what we do it's going to create fantastic outcomes and impact and as we were toying around with ideas there you know um when people would ask us hey what do you use to track those protein fats carbs and nutrition and stuff you know we'd often point them to our excel you know to help out people we kind of put that excel into a google sheets that had, google sheets were new at that time but we like hey you know you can use it you can track it too you just you know type in your food and it'll pull up from some we look up h look ups of of the excel sheet and give you its output you know it was a less than a few hundred di- foods that you can track and we saw that there were like literally hundreds of people using it at some point because we used to talk about it experiment and then people would ask for the sheet and you know give it give the link just just to help people out uh, and then then people were literally using that to track their lifestyle and there was a demand for it so we figured listen while while we still think of what we're going to build why don't we just uh convert this thing into a website it's just so much better and less clunkier for people because you know somebody would delete something somebody would come and edit something out and it wouldn't work so we thought oh okay let's just convert this thing into a website and then we'll see from there and 
you know, I think that website is still continuing. <laughs> you there you know? go, yeah. It's now an app, um, and there are a lot of people who use it. Mm. Um, but it just snowballed into becoming a startup. While we were still thinking of what to build, I think it, this just took a life of its own. Right. So kind of almost like entrepreneur by accident. It was just sort of a natural uh, thing that grew out of this experiment that you had. Mm -hmm. I guess you it started in Kerala, sort of, in a small way, but then eventually you were back in Delhi. I think you were staying at a friend's dad's farmhouse or something. I know you're originally from Haryana, I think, mm -hmm. right? So uh, was it somewhere around there or like what, I mean, what did it look like at that early stage? It was just you and, and Matthew and you're just building this website? So I before I went to University of Pennsylvania, I used to study at Delhi College of Engineering and then Delhi Institute of Technology known as NSIT now. So we just go hang at some of these colleges and uh, try and, you know, recruit interns. And yeah, a couple of kids, um, you know, uh, Simran and Rohit, um, we met them at the administrative block and told them, hey, we're building a school website. If you guys want to come in, you know, we'll probably give you, um, you know, food and drinks and, uh, you know, and, and some extra cash if we have some, but, you know, come hang out, come stay with us if you'd like. So they literally relocated up to our farmhouse. They came up, uh, you know, our place was actually just south of Delhi and uh, they really loved it out there. Uh, and, you know, we used to basically hang out with these two kids and then um, another friend, uh, another son, uh, 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 Vishnu, this, the son of one of our friends out here in Bangalore was in between his college and his uh, medical school in the US. So, you know, he he figured he'd also, he'd heard about us, he'd followed our experiments. So he said, hey, I'd love to join in too in this fun you guys are having. So, you know, four or five of us, we'd uh, we'd, we'd design stuff, we'd, we'd work out together, live together, design stuff together. And, uh, you know, and, and soon we had a website. Okay, so I just wanted to take a break here to talk about today's sponsor, Jungle Ventures, because I think that there's tons of gyan online about how to start a startup, things to avoid. All of this stuff is from the founder's perspective, but what there isn't a lot of content on is how VCs look at startups. For example, what do they look for before investing? And what are some of the red flags for them or just advice for founders in general? And this gap is what Jungle Ventures is trying to fill through their YouTube channel. And one video that I want to highlight here in particular is this video where they actually explain what a down round is. We believe that survival is the most important thing for a business, followed by product market fit and then having enough cash runway to prove your product market fit, as well as keeping yourself and your team healthy and motivated. And therefore, if a down round is a necessity, then you would have to raise it. So if you enjoyed that clip and you want to watch the full video, you can find a link to it in the description down below. And while you're over there on Jungle Ventures YouTube channel, make sure to hit subscribe as well because they're regularly posting that kind of high quality content. All right, now on with the podcast. I, I'm just curious though from a, because there's like a five member team now at this point um, and you did say food and drinks. Yes, yeah, so relatively inexpensive, but still, I mean, money has to come from somewhere, right? Either you're, uh, paying rent or you're buying the food or whatever just to keep the lights on. So was it sort of like you're dipping into your own personal savings from your Deutsche Bank days and you and Matthew or asking money from family and friends? Like what was the, how were you keeping things going? So we'd, uh, we'd committed to spend some money. I think I had committed to put in about 10 lakhs at the outset and uh, Matt, like I think a couple of lakhs and, uh, you know, together we had this little pool of capital that we had uh, we had put in and were you planning on staying in Delhi long term or was Bengaluru always something that you had on the horizon uh, we found us actually the pivotal moment was that we got accepted into the Microsoft Accelerator which was based out here um, and one of their conditions was that at least during the accelerator you have to be here so we moved back and we lived with people who would be willing to give us rent-free accommodations for a few months and worked at Microsoft Accelerator. Yeah. Yeah, and that's when we locked in our uh, angel round, our first round of capital, um, one crore rupees, uh, which felt like an insane amount of money at that time. And, uh, and, and then that's when we started recruiting, you know, talent. We converted those interns into full-time employees. Um, we had to actually talk to their parents uh, you know, to convince them to join us because their parents were like, I think one had a job at Samsung, the other had a job um, also at some big company. And, and, uh, and, and, you know, we had to convince their parents as to why they should let their kids join this uncertain, unknown, this couple of people, uh, you know, in Bangalore instead of Delhi. Yeah. So yeah, you raised that uh, one CR 
angel round from a couple of people at um, Adhar. Mm-hmm. I think uh, you had mentioned their names earlier as well. Yeah, Raj, Raj Mashruwala had really helped anchor the round. And um, Sashi, he was my boss basically at Adhar in a big way. And uh, so he, he kind of uh, also... Uh, helped me anchor the round. And then a bunch of people joined. Sashi Reddy, actually, I'm having lunch with him after this today. Oh, there you go. Um, and uh, he joined in as well at that time. Mm-hmm. He was not at Aadhaar, but uh, he came in because of his friend Srini. Um, and both of them used to invest in angels at that time from Hyderabad. Um, and, you know, I had, uh, I was connected to Srini because of Microsoft Accelerator. And uh, kind of, um, you know, I, st- I still remember that day when there was a friend's wedding in Hyderabad. So I'd gone for that. And in between the wedding, I'd, you know, gone to meet uh, Srini um, in an auto and at this cafe coffee day. And um, and I remember I wanted to show him a demo of the website. And, and Oh, the it, website wasn't up yet? It was flaky. It was up, but, you know, it didn't necessarily work all the time. It was not, it was not launched beyond its alpha version. It was not commercially there. It was sort of just a, like a barely beta. working beta that was, or rather an alpha that was in place. And, you know, I remember uh, hearing from Matt and the other team out there be like, hold on, hold on, you can't demo yet. Wait a minute, like, let us know. And then I'm talking to Shini and I'm continuing to talk and and then I'm checking on the other side in my, you know, in my WhatsApp or whatever it was at that time. Um, you know, guys, is it up? Can I just like, can I demo it now? And then be like, okay, you can do it now. And then, you know, I'd, uh, and, and I'd show him and yep, it worked perfectly fine as a demo. And then, you know, and I remember uh, texting them, okay, it's done. They're like, okay, thank God. You know, everybody relaxed at the back. Shut down the server. Shut down the servers. <laughs> so uh, Shini told me later he invested in me or the company not because of anything else, but apparently because of a good follow-up I did. So I went back home right then, you know, wrote him an email, talked to him about the next steps, uh, about the vision, about what we are trying to do, how we are going about it. And uh, he, he felt it was very articulate and well-timed. And... That was the thing that actually got him excited, which was surprising. You know, I um, I thought it was the product demo, but really it was the follow up. Yeah, I mean, investors. I've heard this a lot that they invest in people first. Um, but so, okay, so going back to Microsoft Venture Accelerator, that was also a really important time, I think, for you and uh, because you met your other co-founder. I think there was a bit of a gap, right, where Matthew had gone back to the US, I guess he he had to walk away from Healthify Me for some personal reasons. Mm-hmm. And so you were like a solopreneur for a little while, right? Before you met uh, your co-founder Sachin. Um, I was solopreneuring it, not really to a large extent, because Sachin was right there. And Matt was actually, uh, you know, involved in helping recruit Sachin as well into the whole vision. So Matt made oh, sure that there was continuity and that, you know, the company would be in good hands. That's huge. Um, Oh, that is massive. Actually, many early stage startups suffer from movement of co-founders. There's something I've seen now as I invest in angels as well, is that one out of three co-founders will, on an average, leave. Um, And and I think that's completely fine. It's at a very early formative stage. And, you know, people are defining their interpersonal equations and also understanding if this is for them or not. And it's normal for that movement to really happen before it stabilizes uh, somewhat. Yeah, um, especially when they're in their 20s. And there's absolutely, so much, right? Like, there's just so much of uncertainty yeah. in life. But I think the good co-founders do it amicably and they do it in a way that's, uh, that ensures that the company goes into a good place regardless of you know personal outcomes. You always put the company first. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And I think you guys would have been, what, you were 27 at that time? Yeah, I think I was 26 or something on that. Yeah. yeah. And whereas Sachin, I think, was a little bit older, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was the adult in the room. He was in his mid-30s and... Uh, had kids. Had kids. Ex-Google. Yeah. Had quite a bit of experience under yeah, his belt. Yeah, yeah. I've heard that he was sort of like a, an engineering or like coding guru. Like he was just like a a genius. When he joined, everybody was just shocked by what he was capable of. Yeah, I mean, I I still think he's an engineering genius. Uh, He certainly was back then. Um, And relative to complete freshers and interns and people who hadn't really built uh, production systems before of any scale, you know, he was like an absolute, you know, level 10 guru of sorts. I I remember one of the first few things he did at some point, I think about a month in, he was like, okay, Tushar, I hate to tell you this, but I'm going to do, you know, RM minus RF. It's like, okay, wait a minute. You, you're going to do what? He's like, I'm going to delete all the code. <laughs> I'm, I'm rewriting this shit. You guys have built something that's not going to scale beyond a few thousand people. And uh, it's okay to demo the website, but this is not a production system. Yeah. He, he was like an expert at building things for scale, right? He had worked on Gmail, exactly. uh, I think also Orkut 
as yeah, well. Yeah. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. We didn't yes. use it in Canada when yes, I was growing up. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, so very experienced. You know, I think that's, I think you need experience, but you also need f- some some level of foolishness to, I think, get a startup going properly. You know, because I think while he brought in a lot of experience for building for scale, fundamentally his approach would be left by himself would be would therefore be slow in its nature right because you're really building for mass millions of people scale and because i didn't know any better my approach was let's launch yesterday let's break things let's move fast i mean we can't keep waiting and you know time's running out and so i think that created this healthy tension you know where uh, me and sachin would often fight about deadlines and timelines where my timeline was always yesterday and he was uh, he w- he wanted to make sure that he builds a system which is 99.9% stable uh, my threshold for stability was far lower because I was coming from a place where the stability was 50%. So, um, but that that healthy tension between two co-founders is very, very good. Definitely. And in spite of the hard work, I think that both of you guys and the team were doing, it seems like that one crore rupees sort of disappeared uh, within yeah. a certain span yeah. of time. You yeah. ran out of money um, and it seems like the website just wasn't um, seeing the kind of traction that you guys were hoping for. What was that time period? I think that was what, sometime in 20? 20... In March 2014, I think, March or April, April 2014. Uh, you know, we had no more funds effectively. And, um, and of course, I was trying to raise. I had a couple of term sheets withdrawn from me at that time, you know, a term sheet that I couldn't secure. So it was a really difficult time when... Uh, funders were being anxious. That there is no revenue model. We had a good team. We had a phenomenal product. We had high engagement. And we had customers, real th- tens of thousands of people who were using us and loving us for our product. Um, that love and those testimonials, I think, kept us going during that time. For sure. Were you still at Microsoft Venture Accelerator? No, no, no. We were, we were, we were out of Microsoft by early 2013. Yeah. So this was, uh, this was just us by ourselves. We you, were, were you had your own office in. in we Bengaluru. had a place called Office. It was basically a house in Indranagar, which we had converted to an office, and uh, we were sharing it with another startup. So we had about the total space was 1,500 square foot, and I think we were we were using 750 of it. Okay. 750 square foot in like a little terrace uh, where we were huddled in. And, you know, our, our uh, I remember our board meetings used to happen literally on the terrace. Um, <laughs> and our conferences were open air conference rooms, which we used to call them. Open air conference was, you know, go out on the terrace and have a chat. Yeah. Uh, difficult conversations were carried out on walks. So when I said, hey, I need to take you out for a walk, it was like, hey, it's going to be a tough conversation that Uh-oh. I need to have with you. Get away from the rest uh, of the team. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, but that's how we managed our early days. Our rent was, uh, I don't know. 20,000 rupees a month or something like 15,000 rupees a month. I heard I heard that your desk was just like right next to the front door. That's right. And people would like, because right now you have a beard, you look very adult-like, but I think at that <laughs> time people would walk in, see this young guy, clean shaven, and he'd be like, they'd be like, oh, it must be the secretary or something. Yeah, so my desk was literally the, what was supposed to be the secretary's desk right there. It was the, it was the reception desk basically. And, you know, that was the one place I could isolate myself from the rest of the guys. So I just kind of sat there and it was also right next to the, the toilet on the floor. So if somebody had to go use it, they'd go behind me. So it was a particularly weird place for me to be, but that was the only place that was isolated from others. So I kind of, you know, I had my own little zone over there where I could take calls and do my things. But it was pretty funny. People used to come up and be like, yeah, I've come. I remember people in suits would come down sometimes from Unilever or wherever else we were trying to partner. And they'd be like, hey, so is this the Healthify office? Uh, can I can can we meet the team? And be like, yep, this is the Healthify office. I'm the founder. <laughs> uh, let's have a chat. You know, let's, let's sit over there. Wow. Yeah. But yeah, that was how the first two, three years were. We did run out of money, but Thankfully, everybody stayed. Not a single person quit. Um, yeah, what, what was it? 20, 30 people? About 20 people by 20 then. 20 people. Yeah, That's yeah. incredible that every And this was like a three-month period where you weren't yeah. able to pay. I think at first it went down to like 30% cut of salary. And then it was kind of like, no, we still don't have any money in the bank. So... Sorry, guys. Uh, yeah, that's hope exactly you stick right. with us. No, I remember Rohan joined us as a designer, and I remember the literally in the second week, I told him, "Hey, bud, we just everybody's taking a thirty percent cut." And you know, he poor guy was already at some twenty five thousand a month, and he went down to like eighteen or seventeen. And then a few months in, I was like, "Hey, man, I don't think we can afford to pay you anymore. So you're a volunteer at this point. If you stick around, I'll make sure that I'll do you right, and that we'll pay the salaries back with interest the moment, the instant I can secure it." And everybody kind of understood that it was a place of, you know, of, from a from from a very genuine place that we were saying this. 
Um, and I also said, if somebody really badly needs some capital for something, tell me and I'll try and figure it out. So I took some personal loans at that time. I remember paying for one of our employees' wedding expenses. I remember paying for somebody because he broke a hand. He was in a hospital. So I remember paying that bill. And all of it was coming through like borrowed money from friends and family. So it was really sort of, in hindsight, in, if I look back, it felt like a dark time, but it just didn't at that time. Again, it was tough for sure. I think the first time a founder runs out of money is definitely very difficult. Um, but most people don't anticipate that, of course, you're going to run out of money at least once, maybe twice before the company goes somewhere. I think running out of money is a rite of passage almost as a founder. And uh, most people think it won't happen to them. But if, if anybody is listening and they're trying to start a company, know that it will come. Almost celebrate the moment it comes. Be like, aha, I finally reached that milestone. And now that once I get through it, you know, I would have earned that badge. And now I can build a really great company. Um and it was great because it really pushed us to the wall. It got us to be hungrier and more experimented. All bets were off, right? We were like, man, we're going to live or die now. So it doesn't matter. And having that level of freedom to experiment was brilliant. That's exactly during those three months that we cracked our revenue model, our primary revenue model that still drives about 70% or 60% of our $50 million revenues today was created in those three months. Definitely. Yeah. You guys had to to look at what you were doing and say, what's working here? and what's not. Mm -hmm. Was it basically with that uh, three lakhs in revenue every month towards the end of 2014? Is mm -hmm. that kind of how you were able to go out to investors? I think it was a bunch of H&Is and, and yeah. raised that uh, $1 million no, fee and, round. You know, I still remember I called Sashi back then and I said, Sashi, you know, the company's running out of money. We're in real deep, deep trouble. Uh, can you help us out? And I remember Sashi saying no at that time first because he's like, hey, you really have to figure things out. Only then will it be investable and fundable. And and then it became that way. And Sashi wrote a big check, as did many other H&Is. Raj and others doubled down. Uh, you know, various uh, Gopal Srinivasan of you know, TVS Capital, others kind of joined in. Micromax took notice. They were anyway looking at what we were doing. They did a strategic investment of a quarter million dollars. And we kind of, we hammered together a million dollar of our seed capital. This is after that three lakh, four lakh a month establishment. And, and after that seed round was in place, obviously we made sure everybody got paid back with interest and whatnot. And that's when we started to tool up, you know, the first proper version of Health of IME's entity. Mm. Uh, so by uh, by by mid twenty fifteen or so, we had a um, you know we had an actual company that was now acquiring customers, building a revenue line, delivering results, driving impact, and you know started to feel and look like an actual company. Wow! So that it took about three years from the kick off of the first version of the website to getting to a real, you know, semblance of a company. Yeah. Sort of product market fit. Product market fit. Yeah, yeah. That's huge. Yeah. And I think that's a stage where when the market is too frothy, a lot of founders miss that opportunity to actually figure out what their users actually want, their customers want. And mm -hmm. they just, uh, they never really get there. And then yeah. they raise a series A, B, C, and then suddenly they're like, okay, like, now what? This isn't uh, this isn't financially sustainable. We can't, you know, we can't keep doing this. Yeah. And if the investors stop the drip feed, then they go out of business. Absolutely. I think capital constraint is a fantastic thing, by the way. Most people um, underrate the value of having capital as a constraint. It drives great creativity. It really focuses you to f get the product market fit right. And honestly, money is not the barrier to achieve your vision. Um, finding the product market fit, having that vision, being able to inspire people is really, is the barrier. So um, money usually follows, uh, you know, sometimes early, sometimes late, sometimes, um, sometimes never, but it doesn't matter. And and I think that was great to have that as a constraint in the first three years for us. Um, and, and I think those memories of those first three years are probably some of my most precious memories at Healthify. Because things were so fluid, um, things were uh, so on the edge, and I think we had a phenomenal time. I often say this to founders that they should at least wait for a thousand days before figuring out a decision on a company, because it takes about a thousand days of hard work. You know, assuming ten hours a day, right? That's ten thousand hours, and you've seen the whole Malcolm Gladwell ten ten thousand hours of work at anything, and you're an expert at something. So um, I think at the end of a thousand days. You're an expert, and I think you're in a good place to decide what the company's future is going to be. Some people call it a day too early, in my view, especially mm. when the markets are too frothy. So they're like, hey, did I get investor capital? If I didn't, okay, I'm going to try something else. But I think it, it requires some level of perseverance to build anything great. Yeah. 
Well, I think it helps too that you started quite young, you know, at 26. Definitely. If you're starting sure. in your like mid 30s, you're kind you, of thinking. Your time gets, you know, the pressure on time is higher for sure. Yeah. I agree with you on that. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I was just giving a talk to MBA kids and I was trying to uh, nudge them that, you know, in the 20s is the best time to start up. This is like, you know, you don't have much debt, don't have much other obligations and it's, the great, it's a great time to experiment. You can always settle for a job in your 30s. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I'm trying to figure out, I know at one point you guys, you and I believe Sachin went to Goa for this conference. <laughs> was that before or after the $1 million seed round? No, no, it's definitely before. This before. is when we were scrambling for all ways of raising any, of figuring out any kind of capital. So one of our experiments was selling to corporates. It can be sell a corporate solution and therefore dig ourselves out of this. Um, it was, in, in fact, it was during these three months of uh, no money kind of a time frame. So even getting to Goa was not so easy and needed a lot of capital. Uh, but yeah, we set up a desk at like a corporate HR conference and, and hoped that we can earn some revenues to cover our costs at that time. It was a brilliant um, experience both of us had because, you know, again, it was down to the wall and um, Sachin was selling our corporate services and uh, I'd be giving a talk and I'd be trying to convince people to buy our services and whatnot. So we were doing actual on the field sales about a product. And um, uh, I remember I was really hungry and I wanted to, you know, I hadn't had breakfast and I wanted to grab a croissant, but that croissant was just 300 rupees, which is unaffordably expensive. So, uh, you know, I kind of just waited till the lunchtime and that, that hunger was very real. And we definitely couldn't afford to stay there um, that night because we, you know, we'd gone around staying at these CD places. Just to be at the conference was an important thing for us. I feel like if you approached me now and tried to, sell, like, if I'm the owner of a company and you've got your your suit on and everything, I'd be like, <laughs> sure, sign me up. But I think at that point, you guys were just, you know, just scrappy young guys. So we, you know, we 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 stayed really scrappy. But you know, when we were at that conference, we we still put on a suit jacket and and you know. Um, uh, an uncle of mine told me that the only way to catch a lion is to look them in the eye, uh, look it in the eye. So, you know, the, the, so we were sort of, we definitely had a larger than life um, projection of Healthify at that time. Yeah. Did you end up, were you able to sign up some clients? Because I know for a little while there you were... For a little while, we were indeed working with a lot of corporates. Um, and it, it did start off a business model for sure. Yeah. In fact, um, 2016, middle of 2016, I think corporate was half our revenues. Yeah. Uh, so it did start a snowball slowly, but importantly, I remember Unilever is someone that we worked with in the very early days. Um, Philips is someone Phillips, that we worked yeah. with in very early days. And I think these were these were people that we had met at that conference, but then followed up and then it started a bit of a revenue line for us as well. So consumer was taking off and, and B2B was taking off and around middle of 2016, these were equal uh, when we were doing, I think about 30 lakhs a month or something, we were doing half and half. When did it become apparent or who was the first person on the team to suggest this idea that would, I guess the first form of it would be Project Artemis? Oh, yeah. Sorry, no, Amadeus. Project Amadeus, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then um, eventually would morph into what is now RIA, which is like a massive, like that is sort of yeah. what your bu business is built well, yeah. on now. I'd Absolutely. love to hear that story. And so that was that was an incredibly exciting journey too. Um, you know, we had raised our Series A. Inventus Bloom and uh, Chirithe had joined us on the basis of just the non-AI capability set. But as we scaled our business, you know, we went from 3 lakhs a month to 25 lakhs a month to close to 50 lakhs a month and then a crore a month kind of a piece, right? We realized that at that scale, it was getting in, in increasingly hard to sustain quality and standardization by just having humans and coaches on the cloud. Um, you know, we needed to also scale our system up to higher gross margins, uh, make it more so that our system, uh, our entire product offering could be more accessible. And that couldn't be done just by scaling the human coaching component. So as we were looking to raise our Series B and as we were trying and iterating with that, I, I remember that it was quite apparent that the, the, the chink in our armor, the, the weakness was our inability to scale uh, exponentially with technology. So we actually huddled up some of our few uh, teammates, uh, Anjan, uh, quite importantly, who's now our chief business officer and practically my co-founder. And so him and I uh, took, he was one of our top product managers at that time, and, and three, four, five of us kind of huddled up at the Royal Orchid for a week. And we said that if we if we have to build for the future, then whatever we've built till now is irrelevant. 
So if we had to reimagine what could, what is it that we could do, and we practically ran a one week long hackathon towards designing a tech solution, an AI system that could handle uh, our clients as well. And we made a lot of progress and we figured what we had built was probably not good enough to be launched to consumers just yet back in 2017, 2018 timeframe. But it is something that can help support our coaches much better. So, you know, the systems from it, uh, that experiment would go on to build the diet planning tool that our coaches use is use the, the you know, the calorie counting software that we use now to design our data sets. Um, the messaging infrastructure that we use now that our coaches use, um, you know, to send uh, good specific contextual messages to our customer customers. So it came out of that necessity of scaling and, and raising a series B uh, for which we needed to be a demonstratedly better tech company. And as our coaches could handle more clients because of that system, you know, we went from 50 to nearly 200 clients to a coach. Our gross margins went up to like 60% and started to look more SaaS-like. And, and now we found a, definitely it was a company that was more investable. It was a product that was more scalable. Um, and, you know, and, and that started running that course. Yeah, it, it feels like the business at that point sort of mor morphed from services with a side of software to software as a service. Yeah, yeah, that that is correct. Yeah. Um, and eventually that, you know, some of the improvements that would, uh, would result in launching RIA, which was our consumer-facing AI tool, it was sort of the chat GPT of that time, but for just health and fitness. Um, you know, before ChatGPT could be envisioned in 2018. It was learning from the messages that our coaches were actually sending to our clients. So in our domain, I think we had we had created like a GPT 1.0 for health and fitness effectively. Um, and we started this model of software and services driving behavior change, not just services driving behavior change. So we had an AI line of business and we had a services line of business powered by AI. Um, and that largely was our business model until fairly recently alone. Um, now we've added obviously the whole connected devices ecosystem as well, the internet of things, but um, that's how that evolved, uh, you know. And uh, today about half our subscribers use only the AI system, uh, Healthify Smart. The other half use the coaching system, uh, you know, powered and levered by AI. Um, but yeah, when, when in 2018 we were designing IRIA or we were designing these systems, I don't think we could have conceptualized that this is how game changing it would eventually be. That's great. And I think basically the the fact that you did this micro pivot and started implementing this AI um, set you guys up really nicely for the pandemic, mm -hmm. right? Which was a terrible event, mm -hmm. um, but I think probably for Healthify Me, uh, right? A lot of people are at home feeling like they're gaining weight, they're not able to do exercise, they're not out and about. Yeah. Um, and so they start looking for solutions. What was yeah. the, like, what kind of growth did you guys see um, from say March of 2020 um, until, you know, sometime into the, the second wave? You know, I think initially when pandemic hit, I think every founder was in a state of shock. You know, so were we, we were pretty scared. We didn't know what was gonna happen. The world seemed like a very dif difficult place. And I still remember doing this one all hands where, uh, you know, I, I literally took my guitar and everybody was remote and I sang, Hum honge kamyab, you know, we shall overcome. And it was a quite a emotional moment for everyone. I think all of us kind of were teary eyed while we were singing that because we were like, okay, you know, we'll, we'll get through this together. We'll be okay. Um, but as it continued to rage on for a while, we realized that there was a significant interest increase in people trying to be healthier and fitter from their homes more so. And I think having that low cost solution, but people were afraid of spending too much money. So having this low cost solution, having our coaches uh, really, really helped. And I think our, our nutritionists and trainers really went above and beyond during that time. I remember people who had COVID or who had family members who were having COVID, but who really went above and beyond to help out our clients virtually. We felt that we were COVID warriors too. And we had to do our bit to help our clients in this difficult time. Um, and we were there for them. And I think the world really thanked us for that. We launched a tool called Vaccinate Me in the middle when the government released its APIs for vaccinations, even had even though it had nothing to do with our business. We figured we've got, you know, at that time, I think maybe 10 million or 15 million users. And it would be great if people can use uh, a tool like Vaccinate Me to get notifications about when they can get their vaccinations. Uh, we actually hired a team called Under 45, which was doing this on Telegram. We were doing it on WhatsApp. Um, 
you know, we reached out to Vinod Khosla, who eventually turned into an investor and who reached out to Mark Zuckerberg and they zero rated our WhatsApp messages. So we could indeed help the country get to their vaccination slot very quickly and efficiently. Uh, we helped vaccinate 25 million Indians in the peak of pandemic waves. And that was a hugely rewarding experience for the team. There was a small team actually, Sumanyu, uh, who's now a founder himself, and Manan, who's now my chief of staff. They kind of co-founded Vaccinate Me and we just empowered them, enabled them with access to people and resources. And they just kind of built this out within days. And within three months, you know, 25 million people were vaccinated. So we did some amazing experiments. We had a great time. Um, and, uh, and I think came out much stronger from it than we went in. I think pandemic also helped the world realize that being healthy, being fit, taking care of your health is important. If you're overweight or if you're suffering from metabolic syndrome, likelihood of people suffering because of COVID was higher. Um, and, you know, just like after the Spanish flu in 1930s, I think it led to a birth of many um, hygiene companies, uh, you know, record Ben Kaisers of the world in, to scale very rapidly. I think this pandemic is going to result in a huge explosion around health and fitness. I, I've heard people say, like, if you're going to start a company, strap in, it's going to be like a seven to 10 year journey. Mm -hmm. And you, I mean, it's gone beyond that. And presumably, yeah. right, you're, you're continuing to build this thing. Yeah. Um, and as long as you keep that same sort of structure of, you know, perseverance, right, just sticking with it and not giving up, you know, these micro pivots every 18 months sort of reevaluating um, that I don't think it's, it's, I mean, it feels very achievable. Like I, I, I listened to a, a podcast that you did a couple, I think a couple of years ago, you talked about healthifying a billion people. Yes. And, I, and that was at the beginning of my research process. And I was kind of like, okay, this guy is like an idealist. <laughs> like, what, what is he thinking really? But now sort of hearing the whole story, like that's totally going to happen, right? Of course it will. Every time you set one of those goals, you achieve it. And usually earlier than you expected. Mm -hmm. Before the turn of the decade is the plan. We have just finished, we've just crossed 35 million. So, and, you know, uh, I still remember, you know, in the early days, um, 2014, 15 timeframe, we used to keep our Wi-Fi password as our target for the number of users. So I remember when the, we were at about 10K or 12K or something, we'd kept this ambitious goal of target. Uh, the the Wi-Fi password was target 50K. And then when we reached 50K, and then our goal was to change the Wi-Fi password to uh, target 5 million. And that was a huge order of magnitude shift, right? And it seemed impossible back then. In fact, when we moved to this new office, we painted somewhere target 5 million as one of the cultural, um, you know, things that get said uh, in, in our company. And then over time, I think people at Madurai Idli Shop and other cafes around were literally using our Wi-Fi password. And then once we raised our Series B, I think we kind of, uh, put in a real security Wi-Fi password. But we used to keep that. That was a cool cultural uh, piece that, you know, our target was literally in the Wi-Fi password. So everybody had to, uh, you know, really empathize with that. It became a cultural a goal to set. And uh, we just crossed our 35th million users. Uh, to use, so, you know, we've, we've come a long way, but there is still a long way to go. And the reason that billion is important is because at the turn of the century, we had the first time as homo sapiens, more people overweight than underweight. Uh, we've never had that as a civilization. And that number was a billion. And uh, in 20 years since, we've had 2.5 billion people who have become overweight. By the end of the decade, we'll have 3 billion people if left unchecked. So really our addressable market, people who need us, people who deserve to use cutting edge technologies, behavior change systems, coaches, AI, to help them is a billion people. And Nandan, my mentor, obviously, one of the times uh, when I was asking him, uh, his advice was always to think big. Because, you know, he said it doesn't cost anything differently if you think big or think small. So might as well think big. And if you think big, you know, even if you land short of it, it will still be huge. If you think small, then where are you going to go from there? So we've kept this audacious target of a billion. But you're right. Uh, when we kept it, I think it did seem a little too big to punch for. But now it, I, I think I'm beginning to see it in the crosshairs. And, and, and that is a powerful realization for me and the firm. I think five years, six years tops, we hope to cross that. 
That was Tushar Vashisht, co-founder of Healthify Me. And remember back in 2014 when Tushar and Sachin couldn't afford to stay in that hotel in Goa and couldn't even justify the cost of a 300 rupee croissant? Well, they actually went back in 2018 with a very different outlook. So I think four years later when we had uh, raised our 6 million A and then our 12 million B, uh, 16 million B down, uh, we felt that it was very important to celebrate. Um, and I think it was a bit of exuberance, a bit of a fuck you to all the uh, bad times we'd gone through to get there. I think we just took the whole company and we just rented the whole hotel. So we, we took up some, uh, I think 200 rooms at Siddhartha de Goa or something. And, uh, and, 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 and did this one night of, of this phenomenal offsite in Goa. Oh yeah, and we served croissants for breakfast. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching or listening to the show this week, and I'll catch you in the next one.